it's academic and it's theater and the place where they both meet. You have to be audience and participant for each other. Intellectual practices, historical practices, cultural practices. Everybody, please. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore Latinos anymore. Work from all around the world. You can come and see and talk about it. What time is it now uh, in Kenya? started out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. A little bit louder, my name is Frank Henschke, I'm the executive director and director of program together with Antje Oegel of the Siegel Center. We do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, but I think everybody here in the audience has been here. So um, you can find out more on uh, our website. Our season is starting soon. The Prelude Festival will be uh, coming in the first week of October. We worked very hard. We're just finalizing the program, so I hope you will be able to join us. We have Romeo Castellucci come, Lepage, uh, and uh, many, many other things, the discovery of Heiner Müller's uh, influential uh, trip in the 70s to the US before he wrote The Hamlet Machine, and, um, and many, many other things. So I hope you will be able to uh, join us, contemporary New York opera. I think this will be very interesting producers and artists who um, uh, 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 are onto something, I think. Something is uh, happening in the scene, so we want to find out. We also welcome Erica Lynn, who is a new member of the uh, faculty and we have Marvin Carlson with us. Um, so thank you for coming. David Safran also is here. And I now hand over to Peter Eckersall, who also starts as the executive officer uh, here, uh, is at the program, but also been a good friend um, to and for the Siegel Center. So thank you for all you do. And he also came to us with the idea to bring James Harding, um, and he will say a few words about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. And. Um, so it's a great pleasure to see so many people here at this lunchtime presentation by Professor James Harding. And uh, um, since I came to uh, the, the, the program here nearly three years ago, I think we've been talking about the, the idea of bringing James up from Washington to present uh, a lecture on his work on surveillance and performance. And we've finally managed to do that. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome James to the program. This is a, a lecture presentation that's co-hosted by the PhD program in theatre and the Siegel Centre. Uh, so we thank the Siegel Centre for uh, joining us in this uh, really interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to introduce James formally and then James will present his paper and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So um, uh, without further ado, I'll just say some, a few words about uh, who James is in case you haven't uh, met James before. He's fairly notorious around the performance studies <laughs> scene. But, uh, um, so James N. Harding is the author of The Ghosts of the Avant-Garde, Exorcising Experimental Theatre and Performance, uh, Cutting Edge Performances, Collage Events, Feminist Artists and the American Avant-Garde, and Adorno and a Writing of the Ruins, Essays on Modern Aesthetics and Anglo-American Literature and Culture. And for many years, I think James' work has been associated with I think not only a study of the American avant-garde, but also his uh, co-edited book, uh, Not the Other Avant-Garde, which has been one of the, I think, really important contributions to debates about the avant-garde in the international arena. Um, James is an internationally known theatre and performance uh, scholar uh, whose work focuses on the history of experimental theatre, on post 9-11 theatre, and on the intersections of surveillance and performance. And it's this topic that he's going to talk about today. Uh, James is going to draw on material from his new book, uh, which is entitled Performance, Transparency and the Cultures of Surveillance, which will be out with Michigan in early 2017. So we really look forward to reading that book and we thank you today for your time and we look forward to hearing your presentation. So thank you very much. James Harding. Thank you. 
First of all, uh, I think the mic works. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, Peter for getting me up here at the Grad Center. Uh, I have lots of friends here, uh, 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 Marvin and David, uh, Jean Graham-Jones, who's not here right now because she's off in Berlin where I'll be in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then I just met Frank, and I want to thank the uh, Siegel Center also for co-sponsoring this. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's uh, 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 always a pleasure to be in New York, but it's a, a, a real privilege and honor to be able to address you all today. Thank you all for coming out uh, uh, during your uh, lunchtime, and, uh, uh, and I hope that the uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, is worth the sacrifice of your lunch, or at least the delay of your lunch. Um, the, um, the presentation that I'm uh, giving today comes, uh, uh, it's a, a shortened version of, uh, of a very long final chapter to the book. Uh, and, uh, and where I talk about a number of artists who are moving in a direction uh, that I think is required by the post-democratic structures of, uh, of the surveillance society. I'm going to focus on a Russian uh, uh, performance artist by the name of uh, uh, Petra Pavlinsky uh, and his work uh, and, uh, and give kind of a profile of some of the uh, most recent work that he's done and use it as a case study for some of the arguments that uh, that come at the end of the chapter, and I'll cite those arguments when I get there. Uh, the name of uh, 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 my talk, as you can see, is Envisioning uh, Performance Post-Democracy, uh, Creative Activism, A Little Bit of Damage, and Surveillance's Inevitable Product. Uh, it draws its inspiration from, uh, 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 from a, uh, a quote from Alain Badiou, uh, who still accepts the idea that found true justice is certainly worth a bit of damage on the side of those who are well off and their servants, and who in the official theater can still find some drama in evidence of these critical facts. Uh, I've been pondering that particular quote for quite some time now, and, uh, uh, and this is where it's led me. Uh, this picks up in, in the middle of the chapter, uh, where I'm actually talking about hacktivism uh, quite a bit, so uh, that's the, the backdrop to the statements that I'm making here now. Um, back in 1999, so we're going to go back about 15 years, a little over 15 years, and then move up to the present. Back in 1999, John McKenzie argued that with the advent of digital technologies, uh, political activism and resistance needs to, uh, need to take the form of what he called inner hacktivity, or hacking that while focused on the interactivity between humans and computers, not only takes aim at technical systems, but also targets social systems. One of the implicit points of reference um, uh, for McKinsey in his uh, discussion of interactivity is the early work of the critical arts ensemble. Like McKinsey, they too saw a clear path from uh, digital to material pol uh, political realities. Indeed, if the political dynamics of the internet provided a microcosmic window into the social dynamics of Western society more generally, then the critical art ensemble's interest in the political significance of hacker communities had a lot to do with, uh, 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 with their resonance beyond the virtual world as a model of opposition for the sites where the more repressive currents of the virtual and material worlds collude. Sites where today the operational structures of the surveillance society are present and active and wield immense authority and power. Sites whose numbers increase unabated. In practical terms, the critical arts ensemble's interest in the image of the hacker suggests that they look to hacktivist disruptions of digital technologies in order to find performative models of disruption that in turn could be circuited back and extended to creative <coughs> activism against the post-democratic structures of surveillance societies more generally. And in this respect, uh, uh, McKinsey's claim, interactivity, hack, hacking, interactive, uh, uh, interactivity, all must be understood as, the, uh, as effects of performative power and as instruments, not only echoed the political aesthetic sensibilities of artists, activists, groups like the critical arts ensemble, but also offshoots like uh, um, the Electronic Disturbance Theater. Focusing on the work of this latter group, Catherine Bernard formulated similar arguments just as the new millennium was beginning. Her arguments focused on the Electronic Disturbance Theater's attentiveness to vulnerabilities that might be exploited, 
vulnerabilities that in internet technologies hackers take advantage of and that by way of their example open the door to the models of what the electronic disturbance theater embraced as a radical theatrical practice. That practice in turn uh, points towards what in this talk I want to refer to as performance post-democracy. Bernard's specific concern was with the artistic counters to the commercial structure of cyberspace, but it is the dynamic behind those counters that is of interest to me here. In her 2000 articles, uh, Bodies and Digital Utopia, Bernard argued that through their own unique approach to artistic activism, the electronic disturbance theater deftly demonstrated that uh, cyberspace contains within its structures resistance tools that might counter the politics of repression. I like tools. People can do a lot with tools. But Bernard's tools are mostly a metaphor, a reminder, as it were, that power inevitably produces its own vulnerabilities, and thus also the opportunity with which to resist repressive politics as well. How activists and artists exploit such vulnerabilities, how they hack them, is a matter of st uh, strategy and choice, with, uh, which in turn is also a matter of means and ends or goals. But the tools, that is the opportunities, Bernard argues, are there. It falls only to those bold and creative enough to take them up, uh, uh, to risk a bit of damage, and to disrupt the rules of repression's game. At some level, it's unfortunate uh, uh, that Bernard did not explicitly uh, uh, broaden the scope of her discussion beyond the political implications of the work of the Electronic Disturbance Theater and the group called uh, Floating Point Unit Fake Shop, to include other artist practitioners who in their own right deserve to be counted among the radical antagonism produced by, the disp uh, by disproportionate power relations and who while having some strong conceptual affinities with hackers communities, at least in the sense of laying hold of the rules of the game solely with the purpose of disrupting it, have exploited power's self-produced vulnerabilities using very different tools of resistance than those literally aligned with hacktivism and electronic civil disobedience. But rather than leaving this statement as an implicit wish that Bernard had somehow written a different article, I want to take this opportunity to update her arguments and draw a rough comparison that uses what is widely considered to be the electronic disturbance theater's most significant act of creative activism from the late 1990s, namely their innovative support of the Zapatistas' rebellion in Chiapas, Mexico, as a conceptual frame for understanding the significance of the work of the Russian performance artist and activist uh, uh, Petra Pavlinsky, and in particular for understanding the context of his piece, uh, 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 Threat, Lubyanka's Burning Door, which began on November 9th, 2015, when he doused the front doors of the Russian Federal Security Service building, the former KGB building, uh, with petrol, set them on fire, and then waited calmly with his back to the flames, holding the gas can in his hands as the authorities descended and arrested him, a lone figure stoically waiting just outside of Lubyanka's literal firewall, a lone figure making no attempt at entry, but making his presence known. Here was a political artist willing to do a bit of damage. My own rhetorical rendering of that moment consciously bridges it to uh, uh, what is arguably the electronic disturbance theater's most important work of creative activism, their development and deployment of Floodnet in the late 1990s on, the, on behalf of the Zapatistas. Indeed, it was the Zapatistas' uh, uh, rebellion in Chiapas that provided the impetus for the formation of the electronic disturbance theater in the first place. As is well known, Floodnet is a distributed denial of service or DDoS uh, program that operates by exploiting the Java applet reload function on websites. It is thus capable of flooding targeted uh, servers with access requests so numerous that it disrupts the server, which cannot process the numerous requests quickly enough and which as a consequence either temporarily crashes or slows to a crawl because it is literally overwhelmed with traffic. In 1998, the Electronic Disturbance Theater had held several pro, uh, 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 Zapatistas actions using Floodnet to target websites ranging from those of the Clinton White House uh, uh, 
that's the previous Clinton White House, not the one we hope is coming. Uh, 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 the Pentagon and those of the Me uh, Mexican President Ernesto Cedillo and the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. As Jill Lane notes in, an, in her article, Digital Zapatistas, no data was destroyed and no web, web page was altered. Metaphorically speaking, uh, uh, there was merely an activist mob amassing outside of the targeted uh, server's firewalls and knocking at its entrances in virtual protest. In one iteration, Lane uh, observes, the Floodnet repeatedly requested non-existent uh, 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 um, pages from the side of the Mexican government. These requests used names such as justice or human rights and thus compelled the server to produce a steady uh, uh, flashing stream of 404 air reply messages stating justice not found on this site uh, uh, and human rights not found on this site. Referring to similar acts of electronic civil disobedience, in a recent book, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous, uh, um, uh, Gabrielle Coleman credits the electronic disturbance theater with pioneering a unique brand of virtual set-ins that combine technical interventions with poeticism and uh, performance art. This combination was in no small part the brainchild of Ricardo Dominguez, who uh, originally was a member of the Critical Arts Ensemble before founding the Electronic Disturbance Theater with Stefan Ray, uh, uh, Carmen Karasik, and Brett Stalbaum. Uh, uh, it was Dominguez who specifically sought to translate the social aesthetics of figures like Bertolt Brecht, uh, uh, Augusto Boal, and Luis Valdez into a vision for the digital stage. But if I may, I'd like to flip the circuit on Dominguez's vision and return us back to the streets 20 years later. With the advent of uh, uh, surveillance regimes and smart technologies, uh, uh, the streets are now every bit as much a part of the digital stage as they are part of the material one. Uh, uh, it is on those streets that we find Petra Pavlinsky, at least temporarily. That Lubyanka's burning door begins on the streets is easier to establish than determining where the piece actually ends. For it was calculated as an intervention that extended by design, not into virtual spaces, but into a dizzying legal maze as Pavlinsky effectively laid hold of the arcane rules of the Russian legal game, making a mockery of the charges uh, uh, brought against him, of the trial where he was prosecuted, and of the conviction it ultimately yielded. The courtroom is always a venue of performance, but Pavlinsky successfully transformed it into an extension of the politically radical performance art uh, uh, that he began on the streets with Lubyanka's burning door and continued throughout the proceedings against him. Like the electronic disturbance theater before him who, was, uh, 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 who linked their artistically inspired digital activism to the Zapatistas' revolt in Chiapas, uh, uh, Mexico, Pavlinsky linked his performance art activism to the cause of anti-Russian activists and artists in the Ukraine, and later also to the cause of the uh, Primori guerrillas, or as they are often called, the Primorsky partisans, who were arrested after taking up arms in a revolt against police brutality and corruption in Russia's uh, Primori or Maritime region near the Chinese border. Uh, in both instances, Pavlinsky allied his work with artists and activists who were willing to do a bit of damage in principled acts of resistance against police terrorism. This became evident as soon as the prosecutor filed charges against P uh, Pavlinsky after his arrest. Initially, Pavlinsky was charged with vandalism, but he surprised the court by answering the charges with the demand that they be changed to terrorism. In part, this was a, a show of support for the UK Ukrainian film director Oleg uh, uh, Sintsov, who in 2014 had burnt down the door of the Crimean office of the pro-Putin United Russian Party, and who as a result had been sentenced to 20 years in jail on terrorism charges. But Pavlinsky's demand was also a strategy that highlighted his own act as something akin to what Baudrillard uh, uh, has called asymmetrical terror against terror. Before setting the security headquarters on fire, uh, um, uh, uh, Pavlinsky wrote, quote, the burning of Lubyanka's door is a gauntlet that our society throws into the terrorist threat introduced by the Russian security uh, services, which is using its own methods of uh, endless terror to keep power 
over 146 million people, unquote. What is noteworthy in this public statement, particularly when one compares it with the subsequent statements that Pavlinsky made upon his release, is the general lack of distinction that Pavlinsky makes between the notions of terrorism and surveillance. The latter of which, while unmentioned, unmentioned here, figures prominently in subsequent statements. I'll discuss those uh, uh, statements uh, uh, momentarily, but for now, suffice it to note that Pavlinsky clearly understands the state's use of surveillance as a key mechanism in its ability to terrorize citizens. And in his statements after the trial, Pavlinsky is precise enough in this regard that one is left with the sense that his earlier demand to be charged with terrorism had as much to do with his use of the basic tools of surveillance, like the video and photo cameras that documented the initial event, including his arrest, as it did with the vandalism itself. Inasmuch as those are the tools that the FSB uses to terrorize the Russian population, they were also part of the artwork's anti-surveillance aesthetic, which involved a conceptual hijacking, a hacking, as it were, of the language, tools, and uh, institutional structures of state-sponsored surveillance. While the use of those cameras, as well as the media spectacle that Pavlinsky created in the courtroom, was as much a part of the performance as the actual burning of Lupianka's doors, the prosecutors were loath to meet Pavlinsky's demand. But they did change the charges. With no identifiable sense of irony of the way that Pavlinsky was playing them into his own performance, the Russian prosecutors countered, not by charging him with terrorism, but by shifting the charges against Pavlinsky from, quote, ideologically motivated vandalism, unquote, to, quote, damaging a cultural heritage site, unquote. This new charge was based on a designation that the former KGB building had received in 2007 and that prosecutors literally justified by stating publicly that the FSB building had to be protected because so many, uh, quote, leading figures of science and culture had been imprisoned there, unquote. And, quote, hundreds of outstanding cultural figures had been tortured in its cells, unquote. Not only did Pavlinsky respond by telling the press that those working in the FSB uh, building had been methodically destroying Russian culture for nearly 100 years now, while at the same time having the gall to publicly declare their building a cultural monument, unquote, but based on the prosecutor's own reasoning, Pavlinsky also had his uh, lawyer, Olga uh, Dens, uh, uh, file a complaint that accused the FSB of illegally replacing the doors in 2008. In the complaint, Pavlinsky and his lawyer asked the prosecutor general, Yuri uh, uh, Chanka, to, quote, hold the FSB employees accountable, unquote, since the FSB had, uh, building had been named an object of cultural heritage in 2007. FSB employees had replaced the doors a year later, Pavlinsky's lawyer pointed out, and they had not procured proper authorization of the Federal Service for the Protection of Cultural Heritage, an authorization that was required by law. Not only were the FSB uh, employees thus culpable of the very crime with which Pavlinsky was charged, but since the doors he burned down were not original and had been illegally installed, Pavlinsky and his lawyer reasoned he had not in fact damaged a cultural heritage site at all. On the contrary, through his act of artistic provocation, he had exposed the criminal damage that had been done to Russian culture and heritage by the FSB employees when they changed the doors and by rhetorical extension uh, when they had detained and tortured Russians' outstanding cultural figures as well. Not to mention the damaging and chilling effect that the repressive surveillance regimes of the FSB and its predecessor, the KGB, have had on cultural expression more generally. While all this legal, uh, uh, absurd legal wrangling transpired, uh, uh, the um, entrance to the FSB building became its own symbolic sideshow since it was sealed off with corrugated metal, literally placing an iron curtain between the public and the KGB's successor, the Russian Security Service. Amid Pavlinsky's disruptive performative mastery of the courtroom, his initial provocative gesture of setting Lubyanka's doors ablaze led to a nomination for the prestigious Russian Innovatsiva Prize, a, a nomination that Pavlinsky accepted 
and that uh, 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 Mikhail Midland, the director of the state-run National Center for uh, Contemporary Arts, rejected on the grounds that Pavlinsky's piece involved breaches of the law and had caused material damage. But for a very short period, Pavlinsky simultaneously stood as a criminal defendant and as a potential prestigious award recipient, all for the same performance piece. Midland's rejection of the nomination did not go unanswered. Inspired, one supposes, by Pavlinsky's own courage, the jury for the Innovativa Prize took offense at Midland's ruling, staged a walkout, and ultimately caused the director to cancel the prize altogether rather than risk the possibility that Pavlinsky might <coughs> receive it. While Pavlinsky's aesthetically inspired activism may have effectively derailed the Innovativa Prize, Ultimately, his status as a rejected nominee was arguably more valuable than the prize itself. If Pavlinsky's work caused award, uh, the award system of the Innovativa Prize to crash, it was having a similar effect uh, uh, on Russia's legal system, where the performative aspects of his work were still unfolding. The controversy generated by the cancellation of the Innovativa Prize increased international attention in Pavlinsky's plight in the courtroom as did the fact that he was shuffling back and forth uh, uh, from different courtrooms on different charges. For Lubyanka's burning door, he faced charges of, uh, uh, of damaging a cultural heritage site. And for his earlier piece, Liberty, which is also sometimes uh, uh, translated as freedom, uh, uh, he faced charges of, of vandalism and petty uh, hooliganism after he and other artists built mock barricades and burnt tires on St. Petersburg's uh, Amali Konyshevi's bridge uh, 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 these latter actions were conceptualized to demonstrate support for anti-Russian protesters in the Ukraine by staging a reenactment of Kiev's uh, uh, Maidan protest that was impossible to distinguish from a protest of their own. In the public eye, the two trials quickly bled together into one uh, uh, composite performance spectacle where moving back and forth between courtrooms, Pavlinsky adeptly, uh, adeptly disrupted the Russian legal process. The courtroom proceedings in the latter case where Pavlinsky was charged with hooliganism proved to be no less sensational than those of the former. After the prosecution brought in a number of witnesses to testify how offended they were by Pavlinsky's pro-Ukrainian protest art in the, uh, uh, on the uh, Malikonian Chevy Bridge, Pavlinsky paid uh, uh, three prostitutes to join in with the prosecution's witnesses and testify that they too were offended. Uh, uh, each one of the prostitutes, Pavlinsky explained, quote, was able to rip through the scenery and demonstrate to everyone reality as it is, unquote. Quote, they are prostitutes whom I paid so that they would come and testify, he added. Quote, and it is the equivalent to the testimony of the other witnesses for the prosecution since they have just as much to do with the case. Uh -uh, they have exactly the same motive, unquote. While the prostitutes added a sensational level of farce to the trial that uh, indicted the entire proceedings, Pavlinsky's goals were clearly larger than his own defense, a point that he made abundantly clear when he rejected the court's proposal to drop the criminal charges against him. He reasoned that he and his lawyer, Dmitry Dentz, still had witnesses that needed to be questioned. Uh -uh. The witness Pavlinsky most wanted to question was a young lawyer by the name of Pavel Yasman. Uh, uh, and Yasman brings us back to some key aspects of surveillance. Yasman has been one of the original investigating uh, uh, detectives who had interrogated Pavlinsky after he had been arrested in February 2014 for burning tires on the Malikonyashevi Bridge. But rather than procuring a, uh, a confession, Yasman found himself on the receiving end of Pavlinsky's mesmerizing vision of the role of, the a of activist art in society. In fact, after spending just over four months interacting with Pavlinsky, Yasmin considered Pavlinsky's vision of political uh, art so compelling that he quit his job at, Russian, uh, at the Russian Investigative Committee and began preparing to become a lawyer. Initially, Yasmin had hoped to become part of Pavlinsky's own defense team, but since his involvement, uh, 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 previous involvement with the case disqualified him, Yasmin stood uh, uh, ready instead uh, uh, as a witness for the defense. The fact that Pavlinsky proved to be intellectually adroit enough to flip an interrogator was certainly a stunning turn of events, 
And most accounts of the trial tend to focus on Yasmin's flip as Pavlinsky's own uh, uh, piece de resistance, especially since it can be pinpointed to a specific moment in the interrogation when Pavlinsky was able to get Yasmin to admit that he was merely a tool in a power structure that instrumentalizes uh, uh, people and everything else. I like tools. Obviously, you can do a lot with tools. But rather than focusing on Yasmin's retooling, I want to suggest that it was the orchestrated backdrop to his shift in allegiances that was Pavlinsky's real accomplishment, and that Yasmin's flip was merely a byproduct, although a spectacular one, of a much grander retooling, a hack, as it were, that took advantage of the vulnerabilities posed by the available, uh, uh, availability of the most basic surveillance technologies and that redirected them into an affirmation of a radical political aesthetic, one that embraces acts of civil disobedience and disruption and of seeming vandalism and destruction as legitimate forms of activist artistic expression and as moments of creative resistance to oppressive authoritarian or post-democratic political formations. One simple fact sets this backdrop into critical relief. Cultural critics can pinpoint the moment of Yasmin's shift in allegiance, not because they have access to the investigative committee's files or Yasmin's notes, but because Pavlinsky secretly recorded the interrogations and then published an edited version of them online as a three-act play. At a conceptual level, the creation of this novel piece of verbatim theater carries slight echoes of Mackenzie's inner activity, his notion of redirecting the interaction between humans and computers in such a way not, uh, 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 that it not only takes aim at uh, technical systems, but also targets social systems as well. Except that in this instance, it was the interaction between humans and surveillance technologies that was redirected, and yet redirected with similar effect. Steve Mann has characterized such redirection as inverse uh, surveillance, or what he has more famously called surveillance. A dialectical concept, Mann's notion of surveillance, which literally means to watch from below, is the direct antinomy of surveillance, which means to watch from above. And like McKinsey's sense that interactivity uh, not only takes aim at technical systems, but also targets social systems, Surveillance targets both surveillance regimes and the social political systems that cultivate and benefit uh, uh, from them. Or at least this is Mann's argument. As a variation of what Mann uh, uh, calls surveillance, Pavlinsky's intervention, his surreptitious recording of his, of his interrogations targeted both Russian security system and its legal system, two of the central pillars of the Russian authoritarian state. In one sense, the term surveillance is a conceptual marker of the vulnerabilities that surveillance uh, uh, regimes inevitably produce. And so it always carries with it a reference to the hierarchies of political power and to the asymmetrical use of surveillance technologies against the powerful by the weak. In Mann's original conception, for example, surveillance referred to, quote, the recording or monitoring of a high-ranking official uh, uh, by a person of lower authority, unquote. And in this regard, there's much overlap between Mann's notion of acts of surveillance and Pavlinsky's notion of his own artistic practice, which he has characterized as, quote, a deliberate attempt to recapture the initiative for the downtrodden little man in the face of the grinding machinery of Russian state power, unquote. But where the American media theorist and the Russian actionist uh, uh, part ways is in Mann's belief that surveillance ultimately is a strategy for democratic accountability, transparency, and objectivity. Not to mention his rather questionable belief that an ever-widening distribution of the means of surveillance uh, uh, will, uh, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, not to mention the fact that uh, his rather questionable uh, belief that an ever-widening distribution of the means of surveillance will counteract surveillance society's reinforcement of post-democracy. Perhaps because he works from within a Russian context, Pavlinsky's vi vision is far less optimistic about the willingness of the powerful to relinquish the tools of authority. They like these tools. You can do a lot with them. So the aim of Pavlinsky's uh, artistic practice, as he, uh, uh, um, as he amply demonstrated in both of the legal proceedings uh, uh, against him, is to suck the authorities into his art, deprive them at least temporarily of the ability to control events. Uh, 
quickly, I missed this. This is uh, Steve Mon's notion of surveillance, uh, uh, and then this brings us back up into the courtroom uh, uh, with Pavlinsky. The goal is to provoke and lure authorities into an engagement on terms with which they are unfamiliar, or to be more precise, on the terms of a tactical creative activism, the political aesthetic of which owes allegiance to neither conventional notions of art or politics. To borrow Noah uh, uh, Snyder's somewhat cliched metaphor, Pavlinsky paints with the mechanisms of power, uh, uh, unquote. And inasmuch as his actions abide by neither conventional notions of art or politics, they point towards the kind of creative activism that I characterize as performance post-democracy. While acts of surveillance may contribute to his goals, Pavlin and Pavlinsky has been careful to disseminate photos and video footage of all his major interventions, right? uh, particularly when uh, 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 representatives of authority uh, uh, intervene, they figure as only one of the many elements on the genuinely ra radical palette from which Pavlinsky draws for his creative activism. In this respect, I would suggest that amid the sensation of, his, uh, of flipping his interrogating, uh, interrogator and of surreptitiously recording the interrogation, it is easy to lose sight of something far more important. The moment of creative sedition embraced in the play that Pavlinsky produced from the recorded transcripts of his interrogation in that play, Pavlinsky offers an impassioned defense of, as well as an uncompromising assertion of the need for artistically unconventional and politically radical works that do not shy away from acts that the authorities may interpret as vandalism. Acts that are the product of a willingness to take on post-democratic formations by doing a bit of damage. Indeed, such works defy even conventional understandings of performance, particularly, particularly as they pertain to established theatrical practice. Quote, I have never worked with performance, Pavlinsky claims. Uh, if you imagine a line where at one end there is opera as a means of communication, and at the other there is a terrorist act as a means of communication, then in terms of the scriptedness of the gesture, performance will always be closer to opera and actionism to terrorism, unquote. That Pavlinsky identifies with the aesthetic uh, 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 radicalism of actionism places him within a rich creative tradition of Russian artistic militancy. He, that he characterizes his artistic practice as a form of terrorism places us back in the courtroom where uh, uh, he had demanded that he be charged with terrorism. There when all is said and done, Pavlinsky had embarrassed the legal authorities so badly that even with convictions against him in both cases, they balked at sentencing him to prison. And so after seven months uh, uh, of detention, while facing charges on two separate accounts, Pavlinsky was released. He emerged from jail only to add a critical coda to his performance, telling the reporters that he had, quote, seen the machine from the inside, unquote and that he had seen, quote, in concentrated form, the surveillance service, unquote. He told reporters that he had, quote, clashed with police surveillance every day, that prison is a laboratory, and that you can see the same thing in so-called life at liberty, the same mechanisms, the same methods of control and compulsion that have proven effective in prison, he argued, are used on the masses, unquote. Pavlinsky's recognition that prison is a laboratory for refining coercive me uh, uh, methods of sur uh, surveillance that then can be widely disseminated to control the public adds an important nuance to our understanding of the role that prisons have in the surveillance society. But one additional observation is, order, in, is in order. Where there is a laboratory, the outcomes are uncertain and vulnerabilities exist that might be exploited. Indeed, in such contexts, repression and its radical antagonistic antinomy walk together. Both develop new methods. Quote, the process of determining the limits and forms of political art is still ongoing, unquote, Pavlinsky argued as he was released. Quote, even in prison, that did not stop, unquote. Though stated in general terms about political art, the immediate point of reference for Pavlinsky's comments was his piece, Lubyanka's Burning Door, which rather than ending with his arrest on November 9th, continued through his incarceration and trial. Even while he was in jail, it did not stop. There the piece evolved, I would suggest, into one of the most compelling works of anti-surveillance political art in the last decade. 
Perhaps a moment of reflection is in order because we've moved a long way from the electronic disturbance theater. Granted, almost 20 years separates Pavlinsky's Lubyanka's Burning Door from the electronic disturbance theater's creative intervention in support of the Zapatistas, and this does not even begin to address the vast cultural divide separating Vladimir Putin's Russia in 2015, 2016, and Ernesto Zizillo's uh, uh, Mexico in the late 1990s. And although I have suggested that we view the former through the distant conceptual lens of the latter, ultimately, uh, um, uh, I am not seeking equivalences here so much as I am piecing together complementary parts of a larger emerging political aesthetic. So in juxtaposing these two very different cultural and historical moments of creative activism, I'm looking for something more uh, uh, than conceptual similarities that might unite them under the banner of Badu's call for a new militancy in theatrical practice, or even under the banner of what I've called performance post-democracy. Rather, I seek an equation that will link electronic civil disobedience with its contemporary material counterparts, and that in doing so will yield something new, not in the naive sense of a claim of originality, but in the sense of being a combination that can point towards the complex militant forms of creative anti-surveillance activism that will re be required in the years to come. The forms that will constitute an effective radical antagonism for the 21st century and a creative activism that then legitimately might be called theater's new militancy because it recognizes and responds to, indeed is inevitably produced by, the new political realities of advanced surveillance societies and post-democratic formations. Like Pavlinsky's own aesthetic practice, such creative activism is, has little concern with the institutions of art per se. The focus of its disruptiveness is elsewhere. If it is to function dialectically and exploit post-democracy's inevitable vulnerabilities, then it must surface where it is not expected and do so with little regard for institutionalized artistic legitimacy in either the present or the future. As Susan Buck Morse has argued in her book, Thinking Past Terror, quote, the institutions of cultural power are not threatened by what the artist creates so long as it is done within authorized art world space, unquote. Though her reference is spatial, the issue raised by Buck Morse is not so much about art produced in and for the traditional spaces of theaters, galleries, and museums, the referent in their allusion to authorized art world spaces concerns the extent to which artists, quote, critical and creative powers are kept isolated from social effect, unquote, irrespective of whether those powers are applied to artistic expression in the theater, in the streets, or in the digital byways of virtual reality. Supplanting that isolation with political efficacy is the great challenge of art in an era of expansive surveillance and increasingly fortified post-democracy. And we, we could do far worse than to conceptualize the art that rises to the challenge uh, uh, at the far end of the authorized, unauthorized binary that forms Buck Morris's argument. The point is that if the institutions of cultural power are not threatened by art, neither are the institutions of political power, those entrenched and fortified forces of post-democracy. In an era of post-democracy, art that is authorized is most likely art that is already contained. The need is for art that is uh, uh, interested less in pushing the boundaries of art than it is in the radical possibilities of creative political expression that occupies, that squats on, that hacks into unauthorized space. Art that is motivated by a willingness to burn down the doors that regulate the political order of post-democratic formations. Art that is willing to be disruptive and, to, uh, uh, and is willing to do a bit of damage. But if Buck Morris's arguments are valid, we might legitimately inquire where one might find the unauthorized spaces of vulnerability that post-democracy inevitably produces and that might be exploited. For there, one is also apt to find the potential spaces of an effective creative activism. Like the hap hackers tap of the return key, they are located, conceptually at least, in the unauthorized command keystrokes and in the digital underbelly of denial of service, DOS notifications, somewhere in the virtual realms just outside of your server's firewalls. 
Like the activist arsonists flicked at the lighter, they are located in the calculated control burn of incendiary dis demonstrations and in the radical return of pyrotechnics to its Greek roots, pyro meaning fire and technicos uh, uh, meaning made by art somewhere just outside of the Russian security services building. Like the graffiti's artists uh, uh, vandalizing a private property, so too are they located in uh, uh, interventions uh, uh, that are without license or permit. Interventions like the infamous 215-foot uh, uh, penis that the Russian actionist and underground opposition art group, Viona, which is the Russian word for war, painted on the Latini drawbridge in St. Petersburg in 2010 so that when it was raised, a giant phallus overshadowed the St. Petersburg FSB building, the former uh, uh, KGB headquarters. That intervention, of course, echoed a similar one taken in 1991 in Moscow when the members of ETI, which is a Russian uh, uh, acronym for the expropriation of the territory of art, spontaneously appeared in Red Square and uh, uh, laid down and arranged uh, uh, their bodies to spell the word cock. They remained there until they were forcibly removed, a result that symbolically enacted the emasculation and expropriation of artistic practice. ETI leaders like Anatoly uh, 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 Molosky uh, uh, said this act uh, 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 as a, uh, saw this act as a gesture uh, towards recovery of public spaces and claimed, for example, that its goal was the desacralization of Red Square and its transformation into a people's place. But whatever its goals, so too was it a concession. Just as the uh, uh, movement's name, the expropriation of the territory of art, takes a sarcastic swipe at the appropriation and neutralization of artistic processes uh, uh, practiced by the state, uh, uh, Osmolowski uh, uh, later admitted that the action was the result of dwindling options for artistic expression. Quote, the only thing left to us, unquote, he conceded, quote, were the streets, unquote. Here, too, we find a faint echo of that pressing question what other options were available? As the Russian security forces made abundantly clear, the streets were not really available and were uh, subject to control. Not even the streets were authorized art space. But maybe there is a space here for a revision. For in moments of political urgency, the streets, like the information superhighway, for, uh, uh, might offer unauthorized avenues of vulnerability that can be exploited, and they, may, uh, uh, they thus can become powerful sites of resistance. Perhaps uh, a recognition of that possibility ends this talk on a more optimistic note. But if those possibilities do exist, they come with a price. In 2013, some 20 years after ETI's irreverent stunt, Pavlinsky entered Red Square himself and rather than dallying about with words, he stripped, down, sat, uh, uh, he stripped, sat down, and nailed his scrotum to the paving stones, an act that quickly garnered international attention. Foreshadowing comments he would later make with respect to Lubyanka's burning door, Pavlinsky justified his act of public self-mutilation, not with the claim that the streets were the only thing left to us, but rather that the streets, like everyone else, had become one big prison and part of a vast surveillance complex where the government steals from the people and uses the money to grow and enrich the police apparatus and other repressive structures. For many in the West, uh, uh, this act was a baffling show of masochism. But for, the, uh, for Russians, there was something all too familiar in this provocative act of defiant self-mutilation. The Russian cultural critic uh, uh, Marat Gulman, for example, placed it in a long uh, uh, Russian dissonant tradition of radical antagonism towards authoritarianism that developed in Russian prisons where the inmates uh, 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 nail their scrotums to the stools when uh, uh, they have lost all hope of being listened to uh, um, by the prison authorities. With his provocative and shocking act in Red Square, Pavlinsky brought this sensibility out into the open, uh, 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 extending it to Russian society more generally. Unlike the playful and carnivalesque uh, uh, undercurrent of the interventions by ETI in the 1990s or Viona just three years earlier, Pavlinsky's act signaled the beginning of a much more serious, consequential, and sober brand of actionism. <laughs>
His was an act of radical antagonism that left playfulness behind and took aim at the stark political reality of, post, uh, of a post-democratic order that had risen from the rubble of the former Soviet Union's bleak authoritarianism before democracy had even had a chance to seed. The point of this action, Gruhlman argued, is to show society and the opposition that we've lost, that the battle is over, they've imprisoned us all and nailed us to the ground, unquote. Pavlinsky's act completely baffled uh, uh, the security forces at Red Square. Not knowing what to do, uh, uh, they draped him with a white sheet, turning him into a fleeting reflection of Gandhi until someone could be loaded, located who could dislodge the nail and hence dislodge uh, Pavlinsky himself, who was poised to become a permanent fixture in the Russian cultural political imagination. Here is elsewhere the blunt materiality of Pavlinsky's crea uh, creative activism, which has been a constant in his work since he sewed his lip shuts in 2002 outside of St. Petersburg Kazan's Cathedral in support of Pussy Riot, is a clear reminder that radical antagonism, exploitation of power's vulnerabilities, or effective creative resistance uh, uh, to uh, repressive surveillance regimes do not require technological wizardry as their vanguard. But technological wizardry and blunt materiality might walk hand in hand into the unauthorized spaces of resistance that lie before us. In order to do so, they will need a bearing that not only identifies unauthorized spaces, but that like Pavlinsky's own bearing also locates the creative imagination and strength to commandeer them. And they will require brazen tactical aesthetics and acts of uh, uncommon resolve. Without a doubt, that walk demands as much courage as it does street smart artistic creativity, maybe more. However much we may marvel at the bold creativity of activist artists like Pavlinsky or of collectives like the Critical Arts Ensemble or the Electronic Disturbance Theater, however much we may celebrate the eruption of art in unauthorized spaces, their creative actionism is the product of a force of conviction, a radical antagonism that outweighs concern for existing legal status, uh, 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 statutes. Savvy though they uh, may be with regard to the intricacies of the law or with regard to the machinery of the legal system more generally, the work of artists like Pavlinsky and the Electronic Disturbance Theater puts them at substantial risk, at risk of arrest and incarceration, at risk of lengthy and personal devastating legal processes, at risk of physical harm. The convoy guards, for example, of uh, the Moscow City uh, uh, Court uh, assaulted Pavlinsky. Uh, so while we might celebrate the courage of their imagination, we must not lose sight of the fact that artists like these possess a rare courage with regard to the personal consequences they potentially pay for their interventions. Maybe this is the same courage that makes their art possible. Maybe too it is the kind of courage that the surveillance society and the era of post-democracy require for artistic practice that is of consequence. Maybe in this era, it is the kind of courage that separates art from the institutions and the commercial industry of art. If this is the case, then I want to suggest that the performance, uh, that performance post-democracy is performance in an era where the rules of the game have in fact changed. And the new rules, to echo Baudrillard, uh, uh, once, uh, 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 to echo Baudrillard, they are indeed fierce. A decade ago, Torin Monaghan, uh, uh, writing an essay entitled Counter Surveillance as Political Intervention, uh, uh, focused on the creative activism of early anti-surveillance groups like the Institute for Applied Autonomy, Trademark, and the Surveillance Camera Players, all of whom he lauded, but none of whom he conceded ever succeeded in moving beyond symbolic conflict into actual physical confrontation. Uh -uh. Settling instead for acts of symbolic resistance with the intention of raising public awareness about modern surveillance regimes, they remained unsuccessful, Monaghan argued, at moving critiques of surveillance beyond the level of in, uh, the individual to their larger institutional political origins. Here again, in a moment of critical disappointment with what artists were unable to achieve, we discover a longing for what art might be and in particular for what counter surveillance art uh, uh, that is motivated by the courage to engage in physical confrontation might actually achieve. A hack, a disturbance, even a bit of damage that discards the quixotic and risks 
to confrontational. Looking in the closing lines of this talk with a critical eye at the interventions by artists like Pavlinsky, I know that some might legitimately ask what he actually accomplished and that some might question whether his interventions, however provocative they might be, ever really rise to the occasion and become, things, become something more than symbolic gestures. Granted, there is little that an individual artist or a specific ensemble or collective might achieve on his or her or their own, but the choice is, I think, between symbolic gesture and exemplary act. Theirs is, I think, a choice to walk the walk and lead by example, leaving us not with symbolism so much as with the looming question, who has the courage to follow a similar path? And art should encourage us. What other options remain? Thank you very much. Okay, okay, oh yes. Well, thank you very much everyone and um, uh, I think we've got a lot to talk about and uh, unfortunately my duties mean that I have to go to a meeting right now so I'll have to take up these questions with you later on this evening but um, um, Frank Henschke is going to chair the questions for us this afternoon and um, but just to thank you very much for that okay, presentation I was very much taken by the way that you drew us into the complexity of questions about activist performance and what that means um, I think in some ways there's a, a really interesting um, mirror of these debates in some of the 1960s interventions mm -hmm. where public space was a previous time where art actually did try and transform public space in really significant ways when there were courtroom performances where the courtroom became a, a theatrical site for parody and protest um, and also where there were explicit uh, body performances as well and discourses around the body that are associated with much of the the radical left of the time. Yeah. Um, I'm also struck by the, the, the parallel uh, hackerism of uh, the Chinese and the Russian authorities in right. recent, for example, recently hacking into um, the uh, databases of the professional sports people and the Olympics people and revealing the, the, the instance where they've taken drugs with, that were banned substances and the way that this is not a neutral side, it's not a leftist side, it's a discourse that is very much a... A tool of contemporary uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, power uh, 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 across across the spectrum of, of political activism. Um, what else can I, I think? There are many, many other things I could say, but uh, unfortunately, I have to leave. But uh, so, thank you again for yeah, your, your okay. presentation. So you and I'll you. pass you over to Frank, who will uh, chair the questions. Thank you, Peter. And uh, uh, he really has to go a meeting of the executive officers and. Um, um, so, uh, first of all, thank you all um, for coming, and uh, uh, as uh, uh, Peter or James said, in your, in your uh, lunch time, it won't be uh, too long, um, but I think it's always good to have a moment to, uh, to, to reflect on what we heard and what we say, so I won't uh, uh, speak too much. First of all, thank you also for your uh, provocative, uh, I think, uh, 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 sharing of, uh, of uh, in, in information and experience and uh, observations and we used to hear from the avant-garde from Russia with Eisenstein and Mayakovsky and uh, and um, the Stravinsky ballet, the, you know, the Zivijinsky. This is quite a change uh, that ha that has happened. Um, maybe uh, just one question before we uh, open up. Uh, so, uh, wh what triggered you to uh, write that book? Why, why is that? You feel this is the main concern of your research at the moment? Um, I mean, the, the motivation for the book in its entirety, I was working on a book that's actually about half done at this particular time. Uh, um, I had finished doing quite a bit of work on, uh, uh, on uh, experimental theater and, uh, and the notion of blurring uh, art in everyday life. And, uh, and suddenly it occurred to me that people involved in espionage uh, uh, are doing the same kind of things. They're orchestrating performances. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I was interested because I don't find that to be a particularly uh, uh, politically progressive type of activity, uh, and yet it fit the model of a lot of what I was saying was avant-garde practice. And I started uh, um, working on that project, and as I got more deeply involved in it, uh, uh, I started running across the stuff with regard to surveillance, and at one point I just went, hold on, I need to look at this, and, uh, uh, and put the espionage stuff on, uh, uh, on hold, and it's still on the back burner, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then dove you know, into the deep waters of surveillance studies and, uh, uh, and started thinking about it from a, a, um, a performance studies perspective. And that was the general motivation that uh, got me started on the book. 
it's almost like a playwright, you know, who works on mind saying, you need this, you start something new in the you know, creative process. There's this great sculpture from Ai Weiwei, I don't know if you saw that, of the classical Greek column with the surveillance camera oh also yeah. carved out of marble as a symbol. Oh yeah. uh, perhaps it will be one of the strongest symbols of the time we live in, and I think you are right. This is certainly what distinguished this decade from others um, where we live in. But uh, let's start right away with questions. Uh, uh, Bella, we'll go around with the microphone, not only so we hear you better, this is also live stream, so people will have it and we have it for our archive. And maybe you say just one word who you are, so uh, people will hear from where the question comes from and they will go directly to him. So um, a question or a comment or a statement. My name is Beate. Um, the Pavlinsky interventions certainly are very extreme, as you said, in terms of his own physical uh, or the physical health. Uh, I was just, it occurred to me, there is something also, uh, this goes beyond the agit prop kind of theater. And also, uh, where the political, uh, the political agit prop of the 20s and 30s were actually also that the political structures themselves, uh, dictatorial structures made use of that. They, they mm -hmm. in a way, they also perform created a performance in order to create a reaction. Right. Can you comment on that, please, on that connection? Um, I hope this answers your question. Uh, uh, the, the larger structure of the, uh, uh, of the chapter from which this is drawn, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Pavlinsky is the last case study there, but the point of departure is a uh, uh, discussion of a, a piece that I saw in, in Frankfurt uh, uh, in the summer of 2015 uh, um, that uh, it's called, uh, the piece is called Ich bereue nichts, right? I regret nothing. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the piece is a first person narrative uh, in the voice of Edward Snowden. And, uh, uh, and I talk about one specific moment in the piece uh, 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 that I'm quite taken by. Uh, 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 there is a lot about the background of Snowden when he was a child and stuff like this uh, 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 that is a part of the narrative. But at some point he becomes the Snowden we know who begins giving us a lecture about the dangers of state-sponsored terrorism and the invasion of privacy. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we need to protect ourselves from this. As he does that talk, the lights in the theater go up Ushers come out with boxes full of all sorts of helmets, right? Construction helmets, football helmets, motorcycle helmets, uh, 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 old Roman helmets, stuff like that. And they start passing it out to the audience. And uh, and while they're, you know, and so we all know what our cue is. We put on on the hats and we're looking at, on each other. And it's wildly funny and amusing. It's also incredibly distracting because while that's going on, uh, 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 Thomas Holla, the actor who is playing Snowden, uh, uh, is is in a process of redressing. And then suddenly the lights go down, and we see that while we've been playing with our helmets, he's been putting on a suit of uh, Spanish armor uh, 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 and, and has a barber's bowl on his head, and he mounts a stuffed horse, and we get an image of Don Quixote. Right? And, uh, uh, and the really interesting moment there is that it, it both suggests to us that Snowden really th is, uh, is a kind of quixotic figure in his belief that he could be uh, fell behemoths like the NSA or GCHQ. Uh, uh, and, and I'm taken by that because that image is so powerful and so moving that it bleeds over into a question about theater itself and the extent to which uh, uh, theater uh, uh, as we know it is, uh, and in other words, theater about surveillance uh, uh, becomes quixotic and I use that as a point of departure for a call for this more militant uh, 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 type of artistic practice, which uh, um, uh, uh, is really not concerned with art anymore. Uh, uh, and is, uh, 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 I mean, and the distinction here comes uh, uh, from the surveillance camera players. Uh, uh, Bill Brown, the founder of the surveillance camera players, he once told me in an email co correspondence that I need to understand that he is not a political artist. He is an artistically inspired activist. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, this, I got that email from him when I first started working on the book, and, uh, uh, and it's worked like a bug inside me ever since. I mean, it's changed my, my outlook. And so, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, an agitprop theater, uh, uh, you know, I don't really like to say, oh, that's, you know, we can't do that anymore, right? Because uh, 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 I don't really 
work in those kind of binaries. Uh, uh, I'm, what I'm suggesting is, is that the, uh, the current historical political situation uh, uh, is calling for a very different kind of praxis. And, uh, uh, and, um, and, and I question whether the, the theater that I know and love is actually capable uh, uh, of, of facilitating the kind of political interventions that are necessary uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to address uh, current political realities. Okay. Maybe two more, one and two. Your third. Thank you so much for that. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about um, what you mean by this term post-democratic oh and yeah. how that's useful to you in conceptualizing performance in the cultural specific space of Russia, but also does it, is it helpful for you more globally? It, it is, uh, uh, actually it's a, it's a very tricky maneuver because I, I don't think Russia is the best example of, of what I mean by post-democracy. And what I mean by mo post-democracy is drawn primarily uh, uh, from a book called Post-Democracy uh, uh, written by Colin Crouch uh, uh, who used to teach at the uh, University of Warwick. It's a very short book. Uh, 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 he works uh, 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 as an economist and a, as a business scholar, and, uh, uh, and his argument is really about uh, uh, the consequences of neoliberalism and the policies that of divestment, right, and, uh, uh, and taking government services and contracting them out uh, 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 to private contractors and modeling them after business models uh, uh, in such a way that, uh, uh, that the government is no longer capable of actually even knowing what its own functions are and can't really provide oversight uh, uh, that would regulate those businesses because now we hire consultants to tell us uh, uh, what those government functions. So it's all, uh, uh, and his, his argument, and I find it immensely compelling, is, uh, uh, is that, that this, this is not just undemocratic, uh, uh, it has progressed to a point that we finally have to admit that, uh, uh, that we have moved into an era of post-democracy. So the idea that we can return to our ideal of democracy uh, uh, is something that he is suggesting is no longer possible and that we have to rethink our political structures. Uh, um, I'm, you know, I, I stay awake at night wondering about whether I really agree with him or not, uh, uh, but I find it uh, 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 so compelling that I think that I need to kind of contend with the, uh, uh, with the realities that he's describing and the consequences of neoliberalism. Uh, uh, that's, the, you know, that's the larger political backdrop uh, of some of the other artists in the chapter that I discuss. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just so compelled by Plavinsky's act. I, and I have to say that you know, what I'm really compelled by is, uh, uh, is the inexplicable amount of courage that Plavinsky possesses. And, I, you know, and the question that I'm really raising at the end is, is where does that courage come from? And, uh, uh, and I'm also asking, isn't that courage necessary for, you know, for, effective, politi uh, for uh, effective political artistic practice today? And, uh, uh, and so I think that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think Zizek's big question who says, does capitalism really need democracy anymore or not? He thinks this is the fundamental I the agree, question I of the time. Yeah. And, uh, he, he, and he thinks most probably not. But uh, Marvin. I thank you, James, for really fascinating, provocative uh, uh, exploration. Uh, it raises a number of, of, uh, of concerns and questions that I find it, be because they, they require us thinking in rather different ways, I find it difficult to even articulate. But let me, let me try to get at uh, what, 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 what concerns me here. Um, uh, and it's not a concern about anything you're doing or, or your interpretation, quite the contrary, trying to g get my head around the implications of this. Um, uh, and, and my question really is, is looking at what are, the, what are now the boundaries or are there any boundaries about this kind of activity and, and its political and, and personal implications? Um, what's going on here clearly is a kind of performative jujitsu, uh, turning the, the, the strategies of the system back upon itself, in part by converting them, uh, or not even converting them, but, but, but calling attention to the fact that they are themselves performative. Uh, and and uh, part of the strategy of that and the risk of it and, and, and the necessity for courage, uh, as Frank says, or, or um, uh, Danger is beyond us. Pointed out the, the the risks that are being taken. 
have to do with with uh, uh, what, what would I say? Uh, again, it's, I, it's hard to kind of get to get my vocabulary around around this. Um, the the uh, uh, maybe something you said earlier, James. It's not the theater we knew any longer. Uh, mm -hmm. Partly, it's not because partly it's not the theater and that we knew any longer. It becomes the collapse of mimesis. It's not mimetic any longer. It's the thing itself. Uh, he is being arrested. Uh, there is real danger. There, there is, uh, there is real. Uh, there's, 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 there's a real payoff, not only structurally but personally. Um, I, I remember having a having a, a an argument with Rustam Baruka in Berlin about uh, whether, in fact, martyrdom is performance. Whether and and it seems to me that you have here a, a person who is consciously embracing a kind of martyrdom in order to expose that performative quality, not only of the martyrdom itself, but of the system in which martyrdom is enacted, created. Uh, uh, and Rustam disagreed with me, by the way. He said, oh, no, no, martyrdom, that, that's going too far. That's not performance any longer. Yeah. I, um, can can so, I respond yeah, to that? I, yeah, I, I guess my question is, what are the boundaries? Are there boundaries, or what are the implications of the fall of boundaries? Yeah, I mean, let, let me address the issue of martyrdom uh, and, as an example, because uh, uh, I think this will really drive it at, at, at the question, uh, uh, or give you an answer to the question that you're posing. Uh, uh, I mean, what I would say is that, you know, those moments of martyrdom that we see now, are so frequently uh, 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 indistinguishable from moments uh, uh, where the person who becomes the martyr uh, uh, feels that he or she has nothing left to lose, right? And, uh, uh, and what I would say is interesting about uh, 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 Pavlinsky's self-characterization you know, uh, uh, as a terrorist is, is that if you look at who he is, look at the life that he leads, uh, uh, I mean, he is fully convinced that, uh, uh, that if they send him to prison, uh, uh, he has nothing, he, he, he hasn't lost anything, right? And, uh, uh, and what he's chosen instead, right? Instead of taking the path of, uh, uh, of violence against people uh, uh, are, are these gestures that are attacking you know, the building. And, uh, uh, and they are immensely provocative acts. Uh, uh, and, he's, and he's channeling it into creative activism. Uh, uh, and, and he's not taking his own life, but you know, he nails a scrotum to you know the paved stones in uh, in Red Square. He's gone uh, atop uh, uh, the main asylum in in, uh, uh, in uh, Moscow. Cut off his earlobe, uh, uh, and, uh, and you know I mean he does you know he's not afraid to do things to his body uh, uh, in order to you know draw attention. But uh, so much of what I'm dealing with in the larger context of that uh, uh, of that chapter is the extent to which the forces of post democracy evolved to the extent that people find themselves uh, uh, not facing any other options, right? If they don't, you know, it, it, whether it is a direct or indirect violence that has been, uh, uh, been uh, 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 pointed at them, they feel like their response uh, uh, is the only possibility that's left. It's based in part, you know, and, uh, and I have real troubles with uh, 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 Baudrillard in this respect, but it's based in part on Baudrillard's ar argument that, uh, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that the events of 9-11 were an inevitable product of the processes of globalization, right? Uh, uh, and there's a lot that we can criticize in that argument, uh, uh, but, but he's working with a dialectic that I find really intriguing, right? The extent to which the forces of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, post-democracy Neoliberalism uh, uh, advanced uh, 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 to the degree that someone feels there are no uh, options available, right? Or they ad, uh, advanced to the degree that somebody says democracy is no longer a possibility. We live in a post-democratic era. The fundamental question is, well, what responsibility does, does an arts practitioner have in an environment that is no longer allowing for democracy? And, uh, and I think that those are the moments, you know, where you say, you know, what are the boundaries, right? Well, the boundaries are to rethink, you know, the political dynamic that, he, that we find ourselves in now. 
I, I, my first question would be not what are the boundaries of art, but what are the boundaries of the political structures uh, uh, in their willingness to uh, 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 disenfranchise people, right? I mean, uh, 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 or you know, or segregate and uh, uh, and police according to race. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, at some point, you know, I think there's a there's a moment, like in the. Uh, 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 the uh, primary uh, uh, partisans. I mean, they took up arms against the police because of police brutality. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Pavlinsky was awarded uh, uh, um, the uh, Vaclav Havel Prize for this piece. Uh, uh, and he donated the money uh, uh, to their defense. And as a consequence of doing that, the, the prize was retracted. They took it back because uh, uh, he was supporting people they saw as terrorists. Right? And, uh, uh, and in fact, they were acquitted, by the way, of, of any charges of murder. But they did, you know, they did take up arms against the police. Uh, and, and clearly, Pavlinsky believed uh, uh, in a kind of armed resistance. Right? And, uh, uh, and I'm not sure I believe in armed resistance. But, uh, but what I would say is, at some level, I think what he's indicative of is us moving into a very new period, historically. Yeah, I, I think maybe you have, if you have still a bit of time to, to uh, also be here, I think we could uh, slowly um, um, come uh, um, to an end. Um, I think it is uh, fascinating. Also, we want to know how do you nail, let's call it an, onto a stone. It's uh, <laughs> uh, something, you know, it's uh, they, maybe in between the stones, but it's also an interesting um, um, idea. But I think what we also can take from this is you know, your question um, or his question, if you do safe art in safe spaces, it, not, it doesn't even change the institutions. How will it have any effect on the society? It's a big, big question. And the last thing, what made me think of, you know, there's the big Sundance from Jeep Sitting Bull, which he yeah. did, uh, self-mutilation, but for a vision, a theatrical, I think, a, a very American art form that perhaps also a bit of a but it was, for a vision, should you go, should you do the revolution, should you do the big fight? And actually, one of the series why he got killed early is because people were afraid because of the dance he would gather the forces of issue once again and there would be an uprising. So in a way, there is uh, also a long line of uh, um, mm -hmm. that uh, perform performing revolution almost. Again, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Really, thank you all for coming and uh, be, please stay in contact. You have your email, I think, through Peter or us and uh, maybe also you have some time here now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.